Okay, rather than try to, uh, typically I try to do a summary, but I, um, I don't. Th I think we're at a point where we we're you know we're moving towards a decision. So I'll just make a few of my own comments uh, to add. Um, the um, I just wanted to let people know, that just in terms of the decision making process and the way I approach this is I I didn't I didn't read the staff report and the staff recommendations until I had uh, had time to read the, the the planning documents, the core area specific plan. Uh, the design guidelines and another one that's been ref hasn't been referred to tonight, but the, um, uh, the core area strategy report and five-year action plan, and then the SCEA, um, that is the the environmental review documents. So I, I say that because I wanted to let those planning documents wash over me. And sort of get a sense of, of what they were communicating and what appeared to be the intent of the community as they put them together and what they were trying to achieve. And I, I actually approached them thinking that they would they would be fairly incoherent, um, that there would be a lot of contradiction in them. But I left them feeling like they were pretty coherent um, and that they did articulate a clear vision and then some means to achieve it. Um, I'll come to that in a second, but let me just say what I haven't heard a lot tonight, and I'm not sure why I haven't, but I haven't heard a lot of critique of the um, the environmental review. Um, and I think as I read it, and as I read the many, many questions that came about it and the responses, I I agree with Brett. I think it's a I think it's a really good document, and I think you know no matter what would happen. And I'm actually really glad to hear Brett say he's not going to, you know, he's not willing to vote for the others, but that he likes. And I think that is, you know, really important to our planning process because we, it's a disclosure document and, and staff and, uh, and, you know, did a great job laying out what needed to be disclosed about the impacts uh, and, you know, what, uh, what were, um, significant and not significant impacts in the mitigations. It was one of the more satisfying environmental documents I've read since I've been on the council. Um, and I think it was, I think it's really a model. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate everybody asking questions of it and digging down into, into real issues about what it would mean to redevelop that area. So kudos on that. Now on the CASP and these 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 documents, let me just say that the you know the clear overarching vision coming out of the out of the CASP as it currently stands is about the economic vitality of the downtown, and I think um, I mean that that's just so central. And there's there's this there's this dual thing that's happening throughout the whole CASP, and I would argue in the design guidelines as well. And that is how do we how do we maintain retail and build it? And how do we maintain residential and increase it? And that was, that was in the core. Um, initially, that's a question in the core. And then, and then the design guidelines sort of take that spread, you know, take the vision out and say, all right, how do we do that and make sure that we don't do harm to the neighborhoods? But the, the central driving force of the, of the CASP, and, and one that I would argue as we think about launching an update, is still the central driving force, is how do we maintain a vital downtown? Um, and we know that it's, a, that, that it's always going to be a mix of, of maintaining people living there and, and, and making sure that our, our, uh, our uh, retail spaces are preserved and, in, and even increased. Now. So that I mean that's that's what the vision is, and then the transition zones and the special character areas and the opportunity sites come in to start articulating how we might achieve those given the particular layout of our downtown. And 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 I I, I I'm struggling a little bit with the concept that you know, that there's sort of an absolute adherence to guidelines or there's not. I don't see that because they're not contradictory, but they recognize that even as you move along a corridor, 
there's a there's there are different things going on there, and you and you may need to do certain things in one place where you wouldn't do in another. Um, that's certainly the case with the Third Street Special Character Area, uh, and it's also the case with the transitional areas. And so all of those things serve are attempting to to lay out a means to serve the vision, but the vision remains the same, which is how do we keep people living in our downtown and how do we maintain retail, and and um, and I kept that in mind as I was reading through the documents. So here's, here's just some additional thoughts. Um, I would say right now, and I, I say this having lived in the downtown for three years, I, don't, I just moved away from there. I moved out to the northern, northern part of the city. Um, but for now, I, I think our downtown is largely a destination for visitors from within and outside the city. So I'm not saying visitors from outside Davis. I'm saying visitors who, who, who come there and then leave. Um, but I really believe that the CASP and these guidelines were about fulfilling the promise that Davis, that the, you know, that the downtown would be the social and cultural retail center, professional administrative center. Uh, if it's to be that, the people that developed these documents, some of whom are here tonight, understood that we need lots and lots and lots of more people living there. The point where the you know the this, the the uh, opportunity sites literally you know hold out this idea of 1,600 more people living in the downtown. That's a lot of people, and I would say on those opportunity sites to date, um, we're probably I don't even think we're in the hundreds. I, I we we're in the dozens since this was written in terms of development of those opportunity sites to bring large numbers of people, new people, living in the downtown. So it would be that 24-hour, they even call out the 24-hour-a-day nature of a city. That's what the downtown was supposed to be. Um, and I find it really interesting because, you know, it does really demonstrate to us how kind of stilted our entire planning process is. We lay out a vision for an area of the city as the city, right? We do it as the city, but as the city, we don't own the majority of the property in that area. So ultimately, we are reliant on property owners to come forward and make proposals for development and redevelopment. There is no other way about it. The city will not ever annex the downtown or seize the downtown in a way that gives the city government, the city as city, control over how things are developed. It is not a master plan thing. It is dependent on people coming forward, putting their money on the table, and proposing projects that will hopefully help achieve the goals. Um, and I think that's really important because we wait and we wait and we wait for projects that will help us achieve that goal. And in the time that I've been on council, um, and, in the, and I would say in the last dozen years, we, Lucas ticked them off. We have half a dozen that are housing, you know, in the 40s and 50s of people. Um, someone talked, and I thought it was an interesting, someone talked about a concern about creating speculation. I, I, think, I think the problem in our downtown is that we have r relatively small parcels that it's very difficult to assemble, uh, to do anything of any substantive size that makes sense economically. We have longtime land land owners, and I don't want to cast dispersions at them, that have you know, would take a huge risk to de redevelop their properties. Uh, I don't think speculation is the issue. I think that we have uh, a downtown that's very, very challenging to develop in. And if you, and Chuck, Chuck Rowe was here earlier, I think if Chuck was here, he would tell you just how challenging it is and how, you know, uh, it is not, you know, it's not the fastest and best way to make money. Uh, you have to really love those projects. And I say, I say all that because at the end of the day, I want to keep going back to the goal. We, the opportunity sites of which this project is one, we're supposed to be part of, are supposed to be part of the 800 additional units that will bring 1,600 people living in the downtown. This, this site and the site to the north of it and further north is part of that. And it's, it's interesting that average densities, and again, I, I see it's average, of 40 units per acre are to be part of those opportunity sites. This site was called out as one of those. It was to participate in that way. It wasn't supposed to do 1600 on its own, it couldn't, but as part of the opportunity sites it was viewed as an opportunity to, to do something that, that um, needed to be done to achieve the ends. And so um, 
that's kind of where I started. Um, fairly dense, fairly dense properties were being called out uh, in that opportunity site and and the Third Street Special Character area, and th and this was this site was one of them. And I found that really, you know, really, really interesting. And that brings to the to the second really significant part, which then comes into the the, the design guidelines. The, the, the people writing these and the groups that worked on these wanted to make sure that that growth, which is substantial, and by the way, it, it, this, these documents actually say we want growth in the downtown. It's probably the only place in Davis where people like use growth in a positive way. Um, we want growth in the downtown, but we also want to make sure that as that growth occurs that we don't lose the character of our neighborhoods, and we don't lose our neighborhoods, and specifically that we don't lose people living in those neighborhoods. We don't want people, uh, we don't want to lose the character of the neighborhoods, and we don't want to lose people living in the neighborhoods. And I see those as two really key things that are happening in these documents. Um, there, and I, and I kind of get an idea of what the two things that people were afraid of at that time. I think one thing that people were concerned about was the loss of, re of residential space to small commercial. What has happened along F Street? You know, we have all these nice little houses that have been switched over to businesses and they're no longer houses. It's clear, it's clear in here that there was a concern that that was going to continue to spread north and out. And, tr and trust me, I live in an old East, I lived in an old eastern city in, uh, east, on the east coast. And that's exactly what happened. Neighborhood after neighborhood, all the, all these you know small commercial doctors' office, lawyers' offices started spreading out, and you would see these old, you know, these old homes, many of them single story, no longer homes at all, and not going back. And so it's clear that that was one concern. They didn't want old East Davis and old North Davis and the area over by the university, Rice Lane University Lane, to be converted to just a bunch of of sort of low level. Um, you know, commercial uh, uses, uh, offices and such. That's clear. I think the other thing that's clear is they didn't want the neighborhoods to experience a sort of dense leapfrog development. And it, that word's not used, but it's clear that they wanted to make sure that density was really contained. And I'm talking, when I say density here, I'm talking about height. They wanted it contained. They didn't want it spreading out to Old East Davis. They didn't want it spreading out to Old North Davis. And that leaves us with the transition zones, right? Because they wanted it contained, and when you contain it, that means there's gonna be a place where it kind of stops and where the neighborhood character, you know, is, is asked to be maintained. And, and, and if you've read Stephen King, which I'm sure you all have, you know that borders and transition zones are always where there are conflicts. And everywhere I've been in the world, that's where the conflict, conflicts don't occur in centers where everybody agrees we need to go higher. Conflicts always occur on borders. And so we're seeing that. We're seeing that. We have a conflict here because we're at a border zone and how we act in that border zone is not apparent and it is not black and white, I would argue, and it is very difficult to achieve. And so we had the transition area that it, in the Third Street Special Character Area that are asked to do a whole bunch of things. So they're, they're, they're supposed to be a preference for mixed use. They're supposed to contribute to housing. They're not supposed to be housing only. They should be two to three stories predominating. And then there are some places that are supposed to have up to 40 units per acre with retail on the ground floor, plazas, no parking on the streets, lots behind with no driveways. That's a, that's a lot to request of, of, a, of a zone. I mean, how do you accomplish all of that? And if the question really is, how do you remain inside the guidelines, I would argue that it's impossible to do all of that. There have to be trade-offs. There have to be trade-offs in that. Um, in particular, how does a project comply with three stories, retail on the bottom, and 40 units per acre? I'm not sure. I, I'm really not sure. So that's the things that I struggled with. And so I'll go to my last point, and I know I've already talked longer than Brett wanted me to. Then my question becomes, if I, if I allow this project in this transition zone that clearly accomplishes, I believe it clearly accomplishes, I'm not gonna speak to global warming and all that, I believe it clearly contributes to the goal of 
the core area specific plan and I believe it contributes to the intent of the design guidelines. I do. I do. It will bring more people into the downtown. It will not bring 1600 but it is a contribution as an opportunity site, called out as an opportunity site. So then the question becomes, what does it do to Old East Davis? What does it do? Um, I think the environmental document has convinced me that it is not going to damage the historical buildings in that area. Now, I know there's probably going to be disagreement about that. There may even be a lawsuit about that. But as it stands and as I read the environmental document, I don't have a compelling case that the building of this structure is going to damage the historical uh, uh, properties in this neighborhood. And I think the distinction between place and historical value based on architecture is really important, and that's the way I view it. So I don't see a problem there. Will it harm the neighborhood? And that's where I've lost sleep over the last several nights. Will it harm the neighborhood? Will it? And, and what does that mean? Will it, in the sense of the core area specific plan, will it drive residential out of that neighborhood? I don't think so. Um, will it contribute to an overdensification of that neighborhood, uh, leapfrog, high rise? I, I don't think so. I don't think it's precedent setting in that way because it's a border property. No one's suggesting it for in the neighborhood, and I can't believe anybody ever would. And so, how is it harming the neighborhood? And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to say it, it doesn't, because I don't live there. And if I said it doesn't, then you get really angry with me. Um, will it change the neighborhood? Yes. There will be changes to the neighborhood if we pass this. Will it destroy the character of the neighborhood? I guess the question that comes to mind is, what is the character of Old East Davis? What is the character? I think even a commenter said it. I thought I heard the word eclectic. Uh, and that was a word that it came to my mind because I've ridden my bike and run through Old East Davis a lot, and eclectic came to my mind. And then I looked up the word eclectic, and I realized that the word eclectic really means that someone, you know, by purpose drew from different tendencies to come up with this new thing. And that's not what's happened in Old East Davis. There was not purpose in the way things happened over there. It would be hard to argue that. If, if, if you accept the, the definition of Old East Davis extending up to 6th Street extended, it contains you know, churches, a strip mall, um, some quirky commercial spaces there on L Street, it, 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 you know, ASPCA, um, apartment blocks, literally apartment blocks, um, old historic houses of, of varying heights, and then single family residence. In other words, the core, the, the character of the neighborhood is extremely diverse. I won't say eclectic, but it is diverse. It is probably one of the most diverse neighborhoods in, in the city. Uh, maybe Manor neighborhood would approach it. There's no other neighborhood that approaches it in terms of diversity. And so I, I, think, I think diversity in a biological system is a resilient thing. Arguably it is what we want to create resilience and I don't believe because of that and because the character is something that is already very, very uh, you, it's unique, but it's very diverse. It, it's mixed up of a whole bunch of different things. I'm not convinced that this project is going to hurt it. And so I come back at the end of the, uh, I come back at the end of this discussion and say, um, I think that a project like this helps accomplish the intent of the core area specific plan. I think it definitely meets the design guidelines in the sense that the design guidelines seek to serve that and, and carve out these different areas uh, that are expected to do a variety of things to achieve the ends. And I don't think there's one, there's one vision of what those design guidelines are um, if you look at the, the different zones that, that I named already. And so I, 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 I will support the project. Um, I will because I think it's it's achieving what we want in in the broader downtown area without bringing harm to the to the old East Davis neighborhood in a way that would damage it in, in as the core area specific plan feared. Um, 
The thing that I want to say about the CASP is what it didn't do and where I think we struggled tonight and where I struggled all along is that um, our core area specific plan has nothing about the economics of building in our core. It has nothing. And if we don't start helping this community come together around what it means to really build in our core, then we're going to be disappointed by every project that comes along because we, we will just suspect that they're they're, they're, they're not being fair in what they're anticipating. So I would like to see, uh, I, 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 what I'd like to do is like to entertain a motion. I think we can get a motion and then I want to see if there are any, any amendments or changes to the conditions of approval. Since we all are in agreement, before we do the other ones, why don't we go ahead and I'll make a motion um, for recommendation number one. Second. Do them one at a time. <laughs>